human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hero. Hey, 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 what's going on, healthy friends? Is everyone eating densely and moving intensely? People have been saying I should make shirts or stickers for that phrase. Anyone want to help design that? I want it to look really cool. So reach out to me if you're a designer. Also for new people or anyone really, I should quickly spell out what eating densely and moving intensely is. A nutrient-dense diet with a full array of bioavailable nutrients and the least processing sugar and other anti-nutrients is what I've been exploring for the past five years and more intensely for the last two. I've landed on the Sapien diet, which is really a framework that many good dietary strategies fit into. Go to sapien.org slash diet to learn more. Moving intensely just means resistance training and high intensity stuff like sprinting. There's nothing wrong with long cardio workouts if you enjoy them. I just don't think they're that efficient time-wise or for weight loss. Start back at episode one of this podcast if you haven't caught them all. You'll be glad you did. So hard cut transition to today's episode with Dr. Sarah Place. She works in sustainable beef production research at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. She did her PhD under Dr. Frank Mintloner at UC Davis, who's awesome and was a guest on a very popular episode a few weeks back. She's also presenting tons of information that goes counter to all the vegan propaganda you hear thrown around in mainstream media or the social media worlds. She works daily to improve the environmental impact of raising cattle. Beef producers also want to do this because they care for the environment just as much, if not more, than a vegan activist. It's their livelihood. They care for animals, care for the land, and care about being efficient for the future of these, as well as actually trying to make a few dollars off this challenging enterprise. Contrary to popular belief, the meat industry gets zero subsidies from the government. Sarah was kind enough to spend almost two hours answering all my questions, partly to help prepare me for the presentation I'm giving at the big food industry conference in Chicago at the end of September, and the friendly debate with the vegan activist lady after. This really helped, and I hope it will help you get the other side of these arguments you never get otherwise. Other updates and thinly veiled promotions include us compiling and editing all our footage for Food Lies. We're really on a roll here and have some great graphics coming together. You can help fund these on Indiegogo by clicking through foodlies.org. My favorite thing I ate this week was definitely the nosetotail.org lamb. I slow cooked some overnight with onions, rosemary, and garlic. Also, the ground lamb with a bit of Greek seasoning is one of the best things ever. Always sad when that runs out. Get a box delivered to you at nosetotail.org and add some bone marrow bones or cod liver or whatever else. Get some extra nutrition in the mix. Also want to say thank you to Christy for helping me daily. She puts together the extended show notes for this podcast for supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash peakhuman. Throwing a few bucks a month helps support all this work. I'll say it again. I really appreciate this community and couldn't do it without all you guys. Much love. All right, so that's it. Enjoy this episode with Dr. Sarah Place and support your local farmers and ranchers. All right, good day. Where are you calling in from, Dr. Sarah Place? Thanks for coming on. I'm sitting in uh, sunny Denver, Colorado right now. Thanks for having me. Very cool. All right, well, yeah, we had a great talk last week. And I told you about my presentation. I'm giving a conference at a conference and a little bit of a debate after. This will be helpful to talk to you and get some of this information and also, of course, just for the audience to get all this information. And I love talking to people like this. I talked to Dr. Frank Mitloner a few weeks ago. I believe you worked with him. Yeah, yeah, he was my uh, PhD advisor when I was at UC Davis. Very cool. So he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I can vouch that he does. Yep. Great. So let's start out. Tell us what you do on a daily basis. Ah, yeah. So it's a little bit varied, but I work for an organization called the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. So it's a producer membership organization, but then we also serve as a contractor with what's called the Beef Checkoff, which is essentially a program that uh, beef farmers and ranchers fund for research and promotion as it relates to beef in the United States. So probably most of your listeners would be familiar with uh, especially the commercials from the 90s, you know, the whole beef is what's for dinner uh, yeah. brand. That's a part of it. And that's actually that brand still exists. And that there's a website, beef is what's for dinner dot com that we manage as uh, NCBA. There's all that promotion aspects of it. But then we use checkoff dollars to do research on topics that are related to beef. And part of that is sustainability. 
So that's what I do is I head up the sustainability research program. We do research with different universities, with USDA. So that's a big part of my job is managing the research, uh, collaborating with these different folks, and then disseminating it. So I give a lot of presentations to a whole wide array of audiences, uh, just providing education and information about you know, how beef is raised and what our actual environmental impacts are, um, both positive and negative. That's really cool. I love how it's it's kind of funded by these farmers and these ranchers and that you told me a, a dollar from each sale goes yeah. to yeah yeah so essentially yeah every time uh, any bovine in America gets sold uh, a dollar goes to this checkoff program and most states have their own state beef council so like here in California there's a California beef council they have an office up in Sacramento and so they'll keep 50 cents of that dollar and then 50 cents will go to the the national organization, the Cattlemen's Beef Board, and then uh, different folks or different organizations like us will will try to or will contract with that national organization. So there's there's a whole network of producer funded you know strategies out there that are at the state level and then nationally too. That's great. I love that you're doing the communication part and trying to spread the information, but then you're also you're a PhD, so you study this. Like so, you actually study the emissions and just tell us a little more about that. Yeah, yeah. So as as uh, kind of the first part of this conversation, right, I, I went to grad school at UC Davis. I'm originally from a dairy farm up in upstate New York. So I've in some way, shape or form been around cows or dependent upon cows my whole life, right? But my research when I was at UC Davis and then subsequently I was um, actually on faculty at Oklahoma State University for about four years was measuring methane emissions from cattle directly. So actually, you know, doing the work to quantify, you know, this this so-called gassy cow problem, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of experience with that, of that kind of almost blending of ag engineering with animal science. And then a lot of the work that we do now, or that I do now with collaborators around the country, is actually more on the modeling side of things. So looking at different scenarios or a big project that we've been doing is essentially benchmarking where we're at as an industry in terms mm-hmm. of what our carbon emissions are, our resource impacts, you know, the ecosystem services that we provide, our economic impacts that we've been working on that project for a while, even before I started at this organization. So it's kind of a, a an intriguing mix of topics still have that, you know, live animal experience and that that research background of doing the actual, the dirty work, if you will, but now also looking at these bigger picture situations and scenarios with modeling. I love that. People think this beef industry is this like evil empire. It's so weird how that, how it's portrayed, but you guys are trying to do the work to constantly improve and make sure you mitigate the environmental impact. Yeah, I think our producers are always super interested in that. And to your point, I think the the perception out there is sometimes it's unfortunate of just how the conversation can kind of devolve into like finger pointing and things like that. But really, that's what's exciting about agriculture is things are always in flux and changing. And we're always looking at, okay, now, how are we going to try to improve more? Um, What can our producers do? How can they, you know, stay viable, economically viable? That's obviously criteria number one for our producers and balancing all these different aspects that are really important. So it's harder to find something that's more important than, you know, thinking about how are we going to nourish nourish ourselves in a responsible manner for the next few decades, right? That's a grand challenge, and there's going to be multiple answers to that. Yeah, that's the big question here, and we can get into it because any type of food has an environmental cost, and we need to think about it. And then there, people love to throw around that, you know, we can't feed the world with beef, and it's this growing population. So let's kind of break it down and see where we get by the end. So what percentage of feed? So the problem is, I already had a call with this lady, who I'm going to be debating on stage, and she just starts pretty aggressively throwing out numbers, kind of just on the attack mode, we had, it was supposed to be a friendly call with the organizers. It was crazy. <laughs> so she's saying, well, we already know beef is you know bad for your health. So then we look at this and it's like 95% of beef is commercially raised and it's you know blah, blah, blah. And it takes up all our food and we could just be feeding it to humans instead. So how much of a cow's diet is edible to humans? Yeah, so it would be um, around 10% of what the lifetime feed intake 
that cattle consume is actually grain that we theoretically could consume. But of course, some of that feed grain, mostly corn in the United States, is not necessarily, I think that's a, a misconception, right? It's not sweet corn, right? It's uh, it's very starchy. Uh, if it was going to get turned into food products, it would be something like cornflakes or high fructose corn syrup, etc. right? So to take a step back, I think to your point, what happens so often and what I see talking to a diverse array of audiences is that people just don't really know how beef is raised. And I know you've kind of covered this in previous podcasts, but it's always good to go back and just for people to realize like beef production in the United States is a very, what we would think of as like an extensive industry. It's an industry that's based on grazing and forage, essentially whole plants. And then we do also finish animals in confinement situations, eating a grain-based diet. Mm -hmm. So uh, beef cattle production takes place in all 50 states, and it starts with uh, what are called cow-calf operations, which kind of gives it away in what, you know, the classification is, but it's essentially mother cows that have a calf ideally once per year, um, and they're typically out on grass uh, raising their calf up, and then when those calves get weaned, From there, they often will go on to stay on grass and be what we call stalker cattle. And then they can go into the feed yard or feedlot. And I think this is where people uh, see an image of a feedlot and just assume that animals are spending their entire lives in a feedlot situation. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not the case, right? It's typically the last uh, four to six months of the animal's life where they were consuming a grain-based diet. Mm-hmm. So to that point, that's super important when we think about what are the feed inputs going into the industry because most of the animal's life and most of the cattle, all the mama cows and the bulls and the, what we call replacement heifers that are the young females that are going to replace the cows, those animals are primarily all they're eating is forage, right? So almost all the feed resources going into producing, say, the 27 billion pounds of beef that we produced last year is mostly forage, stuff that Mm. we can't eat. Mm -hmm. And that's what's super cool about beef and just agriculture in general, right? All that energy, all that material that goes into making, you know, steaks and hamburgers and all these products, it's CO2 out of the air, right? I mean, it's, it's this whole awesome transformation process of photosynthesis capturing this carbon. And then for what we think about for beef, most of that carbon is captured in plants that if we ate it, we couldn't access that energy, right? Yeah. So that's what's super cool about ruminants is they're expanding the energy that we have available to us for food production, right? It's, it's a symbiotic. It's yeah. so perfect. We have cows, humans, grasses. We yeah. evolve together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And obviously that doesn't mean that doesn't discount, you know, of course there's plants that we're more able to consume directly, right? And successful agricultural system is going to need all types of agriculture, But I often feel that just cattle or ruminants in general, you know, it's kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of agriculture. They can't get no respect, right? They're not, (laughs) they're not really well understood. And it's, it's often there, this word inefficient is thrown at beef production, but that just demonstrates that people don't understand what they're actually doing. Yeah. Let's keep going with that. That inefficient. That's like the biggest argument she had. So we we should look at it from all angles, right? There's all yes. kinds of stuff going on, and I feel like their numbers are always really wonky. It's like I kind of try to explain this to some people on the highest level because I get into these discussions almost every day. I actually almost got in like a weird shouting match at a Costco <laughs> with some lady. I'm just sitting there with my cart, and every time I go there, I'm just going there to get dog food. I try to buy like grass-finished beef, you know, from my local farmers or from my company, org. And then she's like, but then I see these ribeyes at Costco and I just have to buy them sometimes. <laughs> and then she's like, you know, a cow had to die for that. I'm like, what? Wait, who are you talking to me? Like, why are you, why are you even talking to me? I'm just like leaving Costco. And then we get into this whole thing. And she was very large, very probably diabetic and very overweight. So it was just this whole thing. And, and I try to explain to people that you can get numbers all different ways and everyone's going to have their agenda and everyone's going to try to, you know, make things look bad on the other side. So, so yeah, let's, let's go into it. Yeah. So just feed conversion efficiency, right? So the idea of how much feed does it take to produce a product is a 
classic example of you can express that metric several ways and get a totally different answer on what you know system is quote unquote the most efficient right mm-hmm. so typically what people will do is take the feed weight right the dry matter what we call dry matter in in the animal science world which is essentially just feed with all the water taken out of it mm-hmm. how much dry matter does it take to produce a pound of product and if you look at it that way there's no doubt that ruminant animals you know whether it's cattle sheep or goats like their meat products are going to have the highest of those ratios. It does take more pounds of feed. But like I just told you, most of that feed isn't in competition with the human food supply, mm-hmm. right? So if we were to compare uh, cattle to chickens to pork, uh, again, on that dry matter basis, cattle would look like they have a lot more feed resources than they do going to them compared to chickens and pigs. But if we looked at human edible feed inputs, in some cases, cattle are actually consuming less human edible feed than pigs and chickens, or at least it's a roughly equivalent across all mm. three. Because they have different stomachs and they need to eat fully yeah. formed amino exactly. acids and stuff exactly. like Exactly. So it all comes down to the anatomy, right? Those mm-hmm. chickens and, and pigs are uh, monogastric, simple stomach animals like you or I. They have to eat feed that's going to be a bit more energy dense, and then they also have to consume higher quality protein sources. So more digestible protein, protein that is going to be more, have that amino acid composition like soy sources, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really key. And of course, ruminants are different from that standpoint because they're going to be able to consume forage resources. And then the magic of ruminants is they have that symbiotic relationship with microbes in their guts. So Uh, It's actually the microbes in the animal's stomach that do all the hard work of fermenting all that material and converting it into things that the animal then absorbs and uses for its own metabolism. Um, But one of the the nice benefits of having all those microbes in your stomach is they're actually a super great source of protein themselves and a whole bunch of vitamins and minerals that the animal needs. So uh, those microbes, when they've served their life purpose, if you will, they kind of pass on through the rest of the digestive system of cattle. And that's how cattle meet a lot of their protein requirements is just digesting microbes. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where when we move to, we think about expressing feed conversion efficiency, like what are the human edible protein inputs going into the system versus outputs? That's where ruminants really shine. And actually, they're a lot more efficient than pigs and chickens. Uh, because mm-hmm. they don't require as much high-quality protein to drive that whole system and to drive the animal. So we've seen that in research that we've funded. There's research out of the UK that shows that. Um, that's been repeated multiple times, where if you express feed conversion efficiency as a protein net protein contribution, ruminants are, are the best from a feed mm. conversion st- uh, standpoint. So that's just one example where it's like it really – your metric that you choose uh, really drives your answer there. Okay. So what about other byproducts we use to feed them? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mentioned, so it's about 10%, 10, 11% for U.S. average, what we found of grain going to cattle. But then another 7 or 8% of what cattle consume is actually byproduct feeds or co-products that we feed in the, in the beef industry. So that can be anything from like, as I sit here in Colorado, we have lots of breweries, obviously. And so things like brewer's grains can get fed to cattle. If you're in California, whether it's beef or dairy, there's so many byproducts that come from all the specialty crops that are grown in that that state, from Mm -hmm. cottonseed to almond holes to all these other parts of the plant grown for crops that we eat directly that we can't consume. Right. So cattle and other ruminants take this waste product and they upcycle it into something of worth. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, it's a really cool system. And again, that's where I think this plant based versus animal source food dichotomy is actually very much a false one because it, it's not reflective of how agriculture works. Um, so there was an interesting calculation that was done actually by a professor at UC Davis, Dr. Jim Fadel a couple decades ago where he looked at this situation globally and his estimate was that for every hundred pounds of human food that comes from crops, there's 37 pounds of byproducts that get Mm -hmm. 
generated, essentially. And of course, most of those byproducts go to livestock, right? So this whole idea that it's either plant-based or animal-based, I mean, our, our agricultural production system is completely integrated, right? We should, yeah. actually, we should integrate it even more. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the grand irony, I think, is sometimes these <laughs> newer generation, like plant-based companies are, are trying to be bold and make a lot of claims um, about how much better they are than animal ag or that they're going to eliminate animal ag. And the irony is if you look in their ingredient lists of their products, they're generating byproducts that get fed to livestock, right? So they can't even eliminate animal ag from their own supply chains, let alone the world. Well, right? yeah, and we just need to do it together. I mean, we used to do more mixed farming, I think, over the course of human history where we would grow plants and animals together. It works together. There should be no argument in separating them or getting rid of, of animals. It's like we're not just going to get rid of animal agriculture and we're just not going to get rid of plants. I mean, even a, like a carnivore person, they're like, all plants are bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's a cycle. Well, it's the, a the animals you eat have to eat something, right? So it's like <laughs> everything everything is dependent on plants and that um, that beautiful process of photosynthesis. So it's just whether you're putting a, another organism between you and that that plant or not, right? But to your point, yeah, absolutely. Both from an energy standpoint and nutrients, it makes a heck of a lot of sense to have crops and livestock together and better capture nutrients and cycle them through the system. Yeah, like a closed system. I actually watched this great documentary called The Biggest Little Farm the other night. It just came out. Have you heard of that one? I've heard of it. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, it's really beautifully shot. It's great. I want to talk to those people, maybe on the podcast. But they found that everything is sort of works in a symbiotic way. And it's kind of this, you can work in this closed system. They have this giant farm that's, you know, all biodynamic, no chemicals, no nothing. And it's just like this perfect system that works together if you do it right. Yeah, and that's, and I think there's some, always there's some misunderstanding about like even what's being done today. There's definitely parts of the Midwest that have like livestock have been removed from the system. And there's lots of interest right now uh, from a soil health perspective and other perspectives on reintegrating livestock. And there's, we can go into some of those challenges of that, but there's also lots of examples. Um, and we found that surveying producers across the country where they're still integrated. So for example, you know, in the Midwest and in like, you know, states like Nebraska, What's a really popular practice is that maybe somebody's a corn, corn and soy farmer, but then they also have cattle too. And what they'll do is once the corn is harvested and combined, like here in another month or two, they'll actually run the cows out on the corn stalks and they'll eat all the parts of the plant that, of course, weren't picked up by the combine, right? Mm -hmm. So half the biomass of a corn plant is all the stalks and leaves and everything else that we don't use. So that's kind of a cool system where one acre of land is supporting corn that could go to any sort of use, and it's supporting cattle for part of the year. That's and great. We, yeah, yeah. We, we have the other cool system is in the Southern Plains, so like Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, where we have a lot of what's called winter wheat grown, where they'll plant it you know, right around now, around Labor Day, and actually they'll graze cattle on that wheat for a few months before they take the cattle off and then they'll combine the wheat for flour. So mm -hmm. again, one acre is supporting, you know, so-called plant-based, but also uh, animal source food, right? So that's, those are some of those things I think people don't realize, like we're already doing that, right? And people are being really successful at doing these kind of integrated systems. And it makes sense environmentally, it makes sense economically for the farmers involved too, to really, you know, think about their whole farm as like a big, a big solar panel, right? And how are you yeah. how are you best using that that energy? Yeah, these farmers are thinking about they're trying to be efficient too cuz not only they care about the environment, they care about the animals, but of course they care about their bottom line. And so they're going to be efficient so that they can make some money. But so yeah, I heard that a lot of corn is grown to make ethanol, right? To make these, Yeah. So and then the cows can eat the byproduct of that. So I'm just wondering yes. with these crazy calculations <laughs> or you're saying there's all these other, we grow corn and then we feed the cows some of it. I feel like these plant-based anti-meat activists use a lot of crazy numbers to try to say how much you know cows are fed. Yes, yeah. And even sometimes folks that I, I think are sometimes 
they, they should be pretty reputable, will say things like 100 million acres of corn in the U.S. goes to livestock. And first of all, there's not even 100 million acres of corn grown. <laughs> so, yeah, to break that out, if we think about corn specifically, I know corn always is – I feel like that's a, a plant that's either like vilified or loved, you know, it's mm-hmm. like it, it, you can't believe that a simple plant evokes so many strong responses, but it does. One thing that people don't realize is that none of these things are static over time, right? So we actually grew more corn in the United States in the 1920s and 30s than we do today, more acres. Oh, wow. But the corn yields back then were only like 25 bushels an acre and a bushel is like 56 pounds. And today, at least last year, it was over 180 bushels an acre. Oh, my God. That's one of those dynamic things in agriculture is you increase yields, and there's always going to be a point of diminishing returns. But as you increase yields, the land area that you need shrinks, right, to produce a given amount of output. So that's what's happened over time. And essentially, you know, corn farmers have gotten super efficient through all these different technologies And so there's just been this interest in how can we figure out other ways to use corn, right? Because it's Mm -hmm. like, it's a plant that really is good at converting solar energy into calories Mm. that we can then use for a whole bunch of things. And so when I think about it. I never thought of it that way. (laughs) Because I'm not a corn fan. I'm not not against (laughs) corn, but it's like, hey, it's a useful thing. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, and whatever your feelings are about it, I think it's helpful to understand of like, that's why we grow so much because it's, it's calories that are, you know, in these little kernels that we can, you know, we can transport easily and et cetera, et cetera. And that's why people have invested in it. Some of that energy now, to your point, if we looked at all domestic corn use, uh, it's about 38% of all the corn used in the United States goes to corn ethanol production or mm-hmm. fuel, right? And it's almost the same amount, 38, 40%, that goes to all livestock. Mm-hmm. And so when I say livestock, I mean everything, right? It's actually all the chickens, laying hens, broiler chickens, turkeys, pigs, dairy cows, and beef cattle, mm-hmm. all in that 40%. And actually beef cattle are around 10% of that corn use. Mm-hmm. So we start with this big bucket. And now we're down to only 10% of domestic corn use, and that's around 8 million acres of corn. Mm-hmm. So it's not a it's not a trivial number, but it's also eight million acres in terms of trying to give you a visual. If you're thinking about a map of the United States, that's about a fifth of the size of Iowa. Mm-hmm. So it's about two percent of U.S. cropland acres. Right. 2%. So it's just not two yeah. percent. I saw that yeah. on a graphic. Yes. Yeah. We tried to show that graphically because I think it drives it home to people. Because of course, you know, how are you supposed to visualize in your mind eight million acres? But yeah. That's truly the land that we are directly using for cattle production that could be, you know, growing zucchinis or broccoli or whatever, you know, folks are thinking that we should be using it for, mm-hmm. right? I think that's what's super important is a lot of these arguments, to your point of how these conversations evolve, they always go, yeah, but, yeah, but the next thing, right? So, <laughs> they move the goalposts. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. It's always shifting around. So yeah, but what about all the land that's used for grow crops? And you say, yeah, well, that's 2% of U.S. cropland acres. And oh, by the way, we generate more human protein by taking that corn and running it through cattle to generate beef than if we were to eat the corn directly. Well, right? exactly. You can go into that for a second that I just posted a graphic from your website and showing that how much it takes to get 25 grams of protein. Yes. Yes. So that's, again, I think people have forgotten why we domesticated livestock is because they concentrate the nutrients in plants, right? (laughs) So, and a big part of that is the protein piece. And this is where that ruminant digestive system is so incredible, right? So corn, obviously itself, if we're to eat it as people, it's a pretty crappy protein source, right? It's always going to be very deficient in lysine. So you have to eat a a lot of calories of corn to meet your lysine requirement, daily requirement. But if you're talking about cattle, it doesn't matter. All the rumen microbes need is nitrogen, and they can synthesize all the different amino acids. So we can feed this fairly poor human edible protein source into the cow, and then in terms of the beef that they generate, they upgrade that protein multiple times over, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what we found if you look at, you know, different scores of protein, like, for example, digestible indispensable amino acid scores or DIAS, and we look at the whole U.S. beef system, we actually generate over two times more 
high quality protein than goes into the cattle themselves. That's huge. Protein's yeah. huge in general. Everyone listening probably knows that. Yes. And that, that's great. So it's, uh, I need to use, I need to remember all these numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So no, that's, that one's really cool. And of course, if we think about other micronutrients, right, I mean, a hundred percent of the vitamin B12 that cattle produce doesn't exist without them. So that's yep. pretty important too. And again, that's where those microbes are awesome, right? Because they're making the B12 in the animal's stomach and then it passes on their digestive system. That's why red meat is such a great source of B12, right? Because yeah. The animal's carrying around this little fermentation vat with it that generates all these vitamins. Okay, so it's it's a way more bioavailable protein. It's a complete protein. Did anyone do a calculation of all inputs and then looking at the protein quality, like the output? Or is it just that two times number? Is that the best yeah, number so we Yeah, that's, so that's kind of the culmination of a lot of research. We have a project that's been going on at Texas A&M and then also a project at UC Davis you know, this is kind of my strategy if I want to have two independent research groups look at this issue and see what they come up with, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been pretty similar in terms of what their bottom line is of over this over two times greater high quality protein being generated. So that gives me more confidence that it's not just a fluke that we miscalculated something mm -hmm. that, you know, if two groups of scientists are coming up with a similar number, then I, I feel like that's a better representation that we're, we're probably close to reality yeah. so is that the best thing to look at i, I just want to know like how someone yeah. could tear that apart <laughs> yeah so what they would do were, were just to be clear the first thing that people would say is well we wouldn't feed all that corn to people anyways right we would use the land to grow something else mm, yeah, yeah and that's where that's where these things get complicated so actually that group at texas a and they haven't published a paper yet but they did look at that and they said okay well what if we took those acres and we did what would probably happen in the Midwest, where this corn is coming from, they would grow a corn soy rotation, right? Because that's what all those farmers are doing now. So especially with the soy plant, because obviously that's a higher quality protein, could we generate as much protein per acre as, again, if we just ran the corn through the cattle? Um, and their answer was, no, we would still be better off running corn through cattle than growing a corn soy mixture if that makes sense. And well, I don't think soy would be good protein to eat at all. No, but if we think about what could we actually do with that land, and that's where I think these discussions sometimes stay a little too up in the clouds theoretical. It's like people assume that like in Iowa, we're just going to start growing quinoa or something. And like, that's just not going to happen. Right? Uh -huh. I mean, there's a reason why we grow some of these row crops where we do, even though we can definitely critique it. We had to think about how long is the growing season, you know, what's the infrastructure that's available to support these farmers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, yeah. So even that's if, a good one. Yeah. yeah. I didn't talk about that exactly. It's like, well, they always just throw these idealistic alternatives, but they don't know <laughs> the reality. Yes. And I think that's the key thing, right? What is the correct and realistic alternative or counterfactual idea, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is the real counterfactual of how land would be used? And that's where I think... You know, actually, some of our environmental organizations here in the United States have been looking at beef production and realized, like, hey, we got to keep ranchers successful in ranching in the U.S. and keep all this land that's currently grass in grass. Because the counterfactual is it gets plowed up and then we release a whole bunch of carbon mm -hmm. or it gets lost to development. Right. It becomes like a dirt bike arena or something, you know, like that's not a necessarily a more sustainable land use. Exactly. Than grazing cattle. Yeah. And then we brought up before, but the whole like Alan Savory, like desertification and holistic land management is that we can stop, you know, desertification and, and build our soil and all that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's um, land. You know, I always kind of go back and forth on which of these environmental footprints is my least favorite, but I think land, <laughs> land footprints are probably my least favorite just because land occupation. Like how many acres it takes you to produce a given food is pretty mm -hmm. much doesn't tell you jack squat, right? I mm -hmm. mean, it doesn't tell you how suitable that land is for alternate uses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you if the land is being used in a multifunctional manner, right? If there's wildlife habitat being supported along with this food production or like those examples I told you earlier, right? We have crop production and animal protein production on one acre. So how are we going to classify that? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And your last point, it doesn't tell you anything about the quality of use 
right? We could uh, have a much smaller land footprint by growing some sort of crop, but we're degrading the soil over time, and so it's not a durable or resilient system. So is that better? That's what I'm always telling them. My big point's <laughs> going to be is plants, like they take and animals give back. And it's a great system. I don't know how you guys think that you're going to get all this nitrogen back in the soil. You're going to just use fossil fuel fertilizers. Yeah, and it's, and it's the organic matter, right? It's all those things working together. And again, it's none of this is either or. And I think that's where it's so that's where it's hard to have a reasoned discussion because people are so eager, to your point, to just jump to, you know, this idealized worldview is how everything should be. Um, mm-hmm. And again, it's just assuming mass irrationality of our current agricultural system. Like, why the heck did humans even? Why did we domesticate these things, these animals? If they're so inefficient, um, and if there's such a bad use of resources, you know, that's, I think the fundamental point of like, why, why well, would we have done that? We talked about that last week. I didn't really think about that angle either. Just this logical, simple angle of 10,000 years ago, or, you know, when we started doing these things, like we weren't thinking about then by, you know, the carbon footprint and all this stuff. It just, we just knew what was right. We knew it was efficient and we knew how to feed ourselves and it grew into what we are today. Yes. Yes. And I think that's what's key is like, are those fundamental reasons that we did this different today? You know, I don't think so. Um, but I think people have lost that connection to the reality of the human animal bond and just, you know, the fact that human beings, I mean, we're a part of nature. We're a part of this world, right? So we, we are manipulating nature, however you cut it, but using plants and animals together makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, okay. So then it seems like the only question is then, are we doing it right in this mass system that we have? And that's, I think what is the big point she's going to try to hit on and what most people hit on is, okay, okay, well, okay, I, you know, they'll admit like maybe it is okay to eat beef or maybe it is a pretty efficient in some way, but then we're doing it the wrong way. You know, she says 95 to 98% actually is industrial meat. <laughs> Just even that phrasing, she of makes course. it sound like it's terrible. So let's talk about like, what are these feed yards look like? And, you know, what does our system look like? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, we have a website called beef. It's what's for dinner.com. And one of the things that we did a couple years ago was we filmed on ranches and on a couple feed yards, 360 degree videos so like you can watch the youtube video and if you have like a little google cardboard with your smartphone you can make it into a headset and just see the whole thing like actually see what a feed yard looks like i mean everything but the smells i guess i would say (laughs) Mm -hmm. you're gonna get that experience because a lot of our a lot of our feed yard operators i mean they're not a lot i mean all of them they're super proud of what they do and i think this perception that 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 segment of the industry is somehow evil is uh, I know it I know it crushes a lot of those folks. So it's insane. Actually, can I jump in here because I did sure. watch those videos, and for one, it was big happy families, hardworking people. They love it. They're like, I get to ride a horse and be with the animals, and they love it. This is their livelihood. They get to work outdoors. They get to work with animals. Two people think that. I used to have this vision, I think, of these animals like stuck inside. For some reason, I thought there was inside. You're not inside. I mean, maybe if a cow goes to milk, they're inside. But otherwise, they're out <laughs> on the yard. I mean, the only the only downside, it seems like, is that it's not on grass. It seems like a lot of these yards is just the dirt, which, yes. which maybe, you know, you can tell me why that works and how, you know, that kind of thing. But, but still, the animals are roaming around. There's no problem. I, I don't that I saw that they they're um, social creatures. They want to be together. They get all the mm-hmm. the correct feed. Just yeah, to go into all that stuff. It's yeah, yeah. So to your point, what often happens is like you'll see a picture, a still picture, two D picture on the internet, and it's like all the animals eating at the feed bunk. And like when I look at that, I'm like, oh, like the feed truck just rolled through and they all came up to eat. Yeah. Um, but most people are like, oh, these animals are tethered by their neck and they're stuck there the entire time, right? And of course, that's not the case. To your point, they're they're able to move around, they have space, and often uh, they do hang out in close groups together, just like they do out when they're grazing, because they are social animals and they are herd animals, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so it's all, a lot of times, it's just the perception of if you see images of it without that fuller picture. And again, that's why we did the 360 videos. So like you can actually look around. Yeah. Um, it helps you better understand, oh, this is how they're actually housed, right? So typically, um, a feed yard in the U.S., they're going to have, I mean, there's the basics of the feed yard. There, there is a feed bunk, there's a pen, there's a clean water source. Yes, the animals are on dirt. And every day, what will happen is there's folks that are called pen riders, they're essentially cowboys, that so will go out and they look at every pen of animals. So every single animal is looked at every single day, evaluated for their health, their well-being. And the animals are fed typically two or three times a day, and it's incredibly precise, right? Like our feed yard guys, they want those animals seriously fed within a five-minute window mm. every day, wow. right? So it's all about consistency of feeding, consistency, and making the animal's life kind of almost as boring as possible because that's what they like. They like it to be very routine. Mm -hmm. And that's also much better for their health, much better for the room and bugs to keep everything super consistent. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of science that goes into it. And I think it's also important to note, like, feed yards are not a relatively new phenomenon, right? This, the larger commercial feed yards where we have, you know, 10,000 plus cattle in a feed yard, that's been more of a recent phenomenon post-World War II. Um, actually, here in, in Colorado, there was a family called the Montfort family that was a big driver of that. Also, Southern California, which people don't realize, in the Imperial Valley, uh, was also another spot where the feed yard industry developed, especially in response to World War II and just needing to produce a lot more beef. And a lot of it was sent over to uh, GIs in, in World War II. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the industry developed to a larger scale. But we've <laughs> we've been feeding cattle corn and grains in the U.S. as long as we've had cattle in the U.S. I don't think people realize that, too. It's not... You know, it was a more grass-based system, but people were still feeding cattle corn. There's lots yeah. of old well, old pictures of, like, actually what they used to do is they fed them whole grain corn, uh, and they would run cattle and pigs together. Mm -hmm. um, and so what didn't get digested by the cattle and went out in their manure, the pigs would eat it. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> that's, well, that's a little gross, but... Yeah, you know, that, uh, uh, we've, we've improved from that standpoint. So, yeah, I'm just finishing Defending Beef. Which is a great book. And, you know, the, the thesis is about, oh, let, you know, let's do raise cows on grass. And yeah, I believe yes. that that's good. And I, you know, that's what I do. It knows the tale. And she even admits the system is not bad how it is in regards to many things and especially the feeding of the grains and the corn. It's like we have domesticated livestock. They're perfectly suited to eat some of this for some of their life. I mean, yes, they eat eating grass for most of their life. And like you said, they, all these animals spend the first, you know, maybe two thirds of their life on grass and then they go to the feed yard. Even her as a proponent of grass finished meat says cows are perfectly suited to eat grains for, as, mm -hmm. you know, some amount of grains. But that's mm -hmm. also not even their full diet. They're given other things too. Exactly. So that's where a lot of these byproduct feeds are actually fed is in a feed yard situation. And they always are getting forage as well. So there's, all these feed yards either have a consulting ruminant nutritionist or they have a ruminant nutritionist on staff, somebody that's usually gotten a PhD in that topic area that will formulate the animal's diet. So it's much more precise. I mean, that's true across all animal agriculture. It's way more precise than human nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and we know a lot more about the animal's requirements, of course, just because of the type of science that we can do with livestock as compared to people. But yeah, it's this is where there's always trade-offs. And I, I definitely respect people that want to only consume grass-finished beef. And, and there there are those producers out there that create that product. And I think that's awesome. And we're all about choices, mm -hmm. what works for people, what works for the producers themselves and their system. But we also, you know, the reality is, that, again, it comes back to the, the resources that we have in the United States. And of course, another country that's similar to us is Canada. And that's why we, we tend to be these countries that do this grain finishing because we have lots of forage resources and we have all this grain production in our countries mm -hmm. and all these byproducts that get developed from processing crops. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of makes sense why the U.S. and Canada kind of lead the world in this whole merging of grass feeding plus grain finishing uh, systems in producing a higher quantity of beef 
per animal that's in our whole herd. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's important I, to come back to your <laughs> first question where you started this segment, right? Mm-hmm. Of like, well, we produce too much, right? Mm-hmm. We, we have this scale issue. And that's an interesting critique because I think it forgets just the reality of like, man, the United States, we got 327 million people in this country. Like, you cannot like large scale agriculture, but we need a lot of large scale agriculture to feed everyone, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's not as romantic. And again, I think it makes sense if people are shocked when they first see a large scale operation and we should do a better job of showing that to people. But we also have to be realistic. You know, 85% of Americans live in cities and suburban areas. And that transition is happening all over the world. We're at 55% of the world population now that lives in cities. So that means there's a higher pressure on those folks that are left in rural areas and that are in production agriculture to produce more because they're going to have to feed more people. That's mm-hmm. just the way the math is working out. Yeah. Um, well, one, we've gotten more efficient too. I mean, our actually our, our cattle herd has gone down over the last century. Absolutely. Yeah. People don't realize that. I mean, the number of cattle we have today is very similar, almost the same size as 1953, but we produce far more beef and we produce far more milk with those cows, those cattle. And that really comes down to a lot of the science. A big part of it is just the genetics of animals, right? Understanding, you know, these animals are better at converting feed into products. And Mm -hmm. so we just select for those animals over the course of generations and it, again, that's that's a benefit whether animals are on grass or being grain finished is just, you know, choosing animals that are more feed efficient. And mm-hmm. we're more wise stewards of our resources when we do things like that. I think the main thing is just acknowledging, yeah, we are not perfect and we can definitely improve. And people cannot like everything that I just said about scale, right? You can mm-hmm. say, well, that's that's great, but I'd still rather blow that system up. And that's a, <laughs> that's a valid position to take. But <laughs> I think we just need to be clear eyed about like demographically where we're actually at in the United States and around the world. Right. You cannot like it, but that's yeah, but where it's, we are. But we're, that's where we are. Yeah. We can go into this and cause this is the thing that I want to bring up with her is what's the alternative or this is where we're at. Okay. This is one big point. If we're talking about health, she says, Oh, so you're going to eat just feedlot beef. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. He's like, I know doctors, you know, I'm friends with a bunch of doctors around the country curing type 2 diabetes and reversing obesity and all these different things with feedlot beef. Like these people don't have a lot of money. And specifically, Dr. Eric Westman in North Carolina works with very low income people. And he's like, hey, eat some ground beef and eggs, right? Like that's a very healthy diet. It's very cheap and it's perfectly healthy. So so for one, I guess we could get into the health side a little bit later, but just this is where we're at today. And I'm like, yes, not everyone's going to afford grass-finished beef. Yes, it would be ideal if everyone was doing biodynamic farming and it was this perfect you know, ecosystem and inputs, you know, closed inputs and all this stuff. But the way we're doing it now, I would still recommend feedlot beef. I, I don't understand what's wrong with feedlot beef and what's the alternative. So first, let's get into what's the alternative If we don't raise cows, we don't have leather. We don't have all these other products. We don't have this Mm -hmm. high-quality source of beef. Like, you have to think of the alternative. Yeah, and I think that's what's super key, right, is to your point about some of these byproducts is that cattle and all livestock, they're more than just food, right? I mean, they're a source of livelihoods for people. They provide these nutrient cycling services that we talked about earlier, right, with the manure that they provide back to crops. They're providing all these byproducts that come from cattle right from leather the leather wrapped steering wheel on your car some things that are fairly obscure but kind of incredibly important right so uh, even the, like the tennis ter- strings or something you know yeah, there's like yeah or even well and even on the human medical side right like the the pericardium the membrane that wraps cows hearts is actually very similar to the same material if you will as human heart valves and mm-hmm. so some of our packing plants what they do is they harvest that pericardium and then that gets used for heart valve replacements for people mm-hmm. so, so it's what's all t- you're gonna have to produce these synthetically <laughs> exactly yeah yeah these are not things that when people are eating ground beef they're not thinking well i just helped provide a, a heart valve for somebody right but mm-hmm. you are right that's a co-product of that system and to your point that's where it's infinitely complex and and in terms of quantifying all that all these studies that most people cite they are not looking at that right yeah. they're not they're ignoring that because there's one to do those studies we're looking at trying to do some of that right now and unfortunately like the modeling is really complex and the way that some of these models have been done 
you know, where you'll see like a bar chart of like, uh, beef, pork, you know, some sort of plant-based alternative. Um, this is how much CO2 gets produced, right? Different mm-hmm. heights of bars. But that does not account for any of these ripple effects. Yeah. And even the scientists that do these kind of life cycle assessments would tell you, yeah, we shouldn't be comparing things like that. But it's essentially the, the horse is out of the barn and down the road like a couple miles. People mm-hmm. have just been doing this inappropriately for years now. Yeah. Um, there was a study that didn't look at all the byproducts, but it did look at these bigger, bigger issues in a scenario analysis in the United States. Uh, it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Sciences. White and Hall are the, the author's last names, where they looked at what if we literally eliminated all livestock in the United States? Like mm-hmm. What would happen? So what would happen from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint and what would happen from a human nutrient supply standpoint? So they found that we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by only 2.6 percentage points. So that's not even, you know, if you look at the EPA inventory, actually livestock produce 4% of emissions, right? So you don't get that full reduction because to the point you made earlier, you have no animal manure, you're going to have to use more synthetic fertilizers. So all these other things would add greenhouse gas emissions back. Yeah, yeah. And then on the nutrition side, you would produce more pounds of food, you would produce more calories, We, of course, don't have a calorie deficit in America right now. (laughs) But you wouldn't produce enough essential micronutrients, right? Things like vitamin B12, we would not have enough. We wouldn't have any from our food supply. Well, it's like Jared Diamond made the point. Well, he's famous for saying that agriculture was the biggest mistake in human history. But he also said that we can create more calories per acre, but far less nutrients per acre when we switch to agriculture from hunter-gatherer days. Yeah, I think... I think we see that in, uh, you know, what happened to human height in the yeah. fossil record and head brain size, the yeah, robustness exactly. or the thickness of our bones, all this stuff yes. went down. Yes, which is what drives home, you know, now we see, you know, just these loose correlations, right? But countries that eat more animal source foods, they tend to be taller. Countries that eat more animal source foods, they tend to have less stunting in children, right? Mm-hmm. So. I found that study and posted about it. But yeah. 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 That's where it's like this this argument that we eat too much is like what we're hiding and we're not hiding, but we're avoiding all these micronutrient deficiencies by eating animal source foods. Yeah. So we need to be very clear eyed about these recommendations to cut back on animal source foods. Like, are you going to start revealing, you know, these micronutrient deficiencies population wide if these, you know, scenarios that people are putting forward came true? Yeah, this is the big point. I always talk about nutrient density. And if you just think about the nutrient density, it's basically what we're talking about is you can get more calories, but it's you're going to have to eat maybe five times much more of these empty calories to try to get that same amount of nutrients. So that's why we're, we're fat as a country. It's like we're eating more to get the same amount of protein or the same amount of calories. That's one way to look at it is that it's kind of the protein leverage hypothesis and it actually kind of ties into like even a nutrient leverage hypothesis where what happened in 1980 when we started this obesity epidemic started is that's when our food got watered down just filled with sugars and grains and vegetable oils so people are like oh why is there we eat like 800 more calories per day than in 19 something right i the people throw these numbers around and it's like why did people just all of a sudden get turn into like greedy you know like massive maniacs? failure of massive yeah, failure of willpower, of willpower yeah. yeah or <laughs> is it that we we were trying to our bodies are trying to get the same nutrients and the same protein but since they're watered all these foods and processed foods are watered down with all these extra calories that we have to overeat to get that nutrient yeah i think that's it, it's so complex right because so many things change at once including this this kind of newfangled idea of, you know, thou shalt eat this one diet to rule them all to prevent, Mm -hmm. you know, chronic disease in the future, which is a a very new idea, really. But yeah, it's, that's why we, you know, that, as you mentioned, that graphic that we have on our website, you know, it's just to drive that home to people of like, if you think about protein requirements, or even just like a specific, you know, amino acid, like if you want to meet your leucine requirements, you don't have to eat as many calories if you're eating beef or eggs or, you know, whatever it may be, animal source yeah, food. Sure, yeah. yeah, right. To to hit that absolute requirement that you have. And that's like, where, again, from a as an animal scientist, I always look at somehow or the, the ways that this nutrition conversation is framed is kind of bizarre to me because I think of nutrition with animals and we're thinking about nutritional adequacy 
and what are the nutrient requirements to meet, you know, certain physiologic outcomes. And in human nutrition, we seem to have transitioned to thinking about food as like it's a good food or a bad food, a mm-hmm. healthy food, or, you know, it's like, and it's all about, again, this framing of, you know, relative risk ratios and stuff. And we forgot, you know, to your point of just like, what are the nutrients that you need, right? Yeah. To thrive as a person. Like, I think that's criteria number one. Well, yeah, that's a problem with these plant-based activist people is they won't even admit this part. So then that's why I can see they can say we should get rid of animal agriculture because they're not even understanding human like nutrition needs. And so they think that eating a bunch of corn and wheat and soy or whatever else we're growing here is going to be a good alternative or yeah. even just pure plants. I mean, okay, forget those. Maybe those crops are bad. Some people agree that those are the bad crops and that humans shouldn't be eating those that much anyway. But still, like we can't get all these nutrients from all the plant foods. No, yeah, we're, yeah, it just it turns out, well, again, we're omnivorous. And that's, I didn't mention that, but even, you know, pigs and chickens, guess what? They're omnivores too, right? Even though we feed them mostly vegetarian diets now. Mm-hmm. But, and that's where, because when you, just to break it down, I mean, if you're an animal, and you eat an animal, it's going to meet most of your nutrient requirements. And it's like, it's not that hard, right? That's uh, it's yeah. pretty basic. Yeah, we're, we're, to your point, in this situation where I don't think people want to acknowledge that there are potential issues with nutrient adequacy. Usually when that is brought up, it's usually a developing country framing, mm-hmm. which it very much is in the developing world. But that's, we don't want to go backwards. We don't want to take our fairly good nutrient status that we have in wealthier countries and, you know, retrograde back to <laughs> not having adequate well, yeah. Right? Well, we do have nutritional adequacies in America with iron. I think. Well, that's true. Yes. How many percent of females are deficient yes. in iron and, and in protein? <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of that, you know, it's super interesting when you look into the consumption data, right? I mean, women tend to be more susceptible, I think, right, to some of the, or at least when you look at the data, more susceptible to these recommendations to eat more plant-based or eat less red meat. Mm-hmm. And of course, women arguably are the ones that should be eating more of that red meat anyways, especially premenopausal women. Yeah. So those are some of those perverse unintended consequences of some of these discussions, I think, uh, to your point. And it's way bigger than protein, but protein is usually what these folks talk about. And um, using the RDA, the recommended daily allowance of you know, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight and saying, oh, we can easily hit that with plant-based sources. So why are we even talking about this? Right. It's insane. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've heard, (laughs) I've heard protein researchers say, you know, they're very keen on making sure that that minimum is not changed, right. That we don't acknowledge that maybe that's not optimum. Right. Mm -hmm. Because if we move that RDA up, you know, or that goalpost up in these diet scenarios, then it's really hard to ever envision a plant-based scenario that works. Yeah, right? well, that's so a think, good point too. Oh, I think yeah. that's a key reason why this uh, discussion really latches onto that number and that RDA and this idea that we're overeating protein because if it turns out that's not optimum, then plant-based has a really hard time of making its case. That's a good point. Back to them not being able to make their case. So I want to like recap some things and finish off on some things. So 82% of the life of a cow is eating grass and other forage. 7% is other byproduct feeds and about 11% is the grain. And so how come people are throwing around numbers to me like on Instagram yesterday, actually, for example, that 67% of U.S. crops are grown for animal agriculture. Do you know anything about that number? So, I mean, you know, part and my, my facetious answer is like, you know, 87% of statistics are made up on the fly or whatever. I mean, it's part of <laughs> yeah. the problem with this field. Uh, <laughs> I have a, well, I have a little joke that recent studies can conclude that recent studies can conclude anything you want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I would suspect what that is, is looking at all feed grains and again, all livestock, right? Mm-hmm. All domestic feed grains and soy use in livestock maybe would get you to that number, which is very different than beef specifically. Mm, yeah, so, you're talking about chicken. T- well, that's a whole exactly. other story. You're a beef person, and I'm a, right. I eat, and also like actually on this call, this woman asked me why, like if I eat chicken, I'm like, well, actually, I don't. 
I don't think it's particularly nutritious and it seems to be raised a lot more poorly and there's more problems with it maybe with how we do it. Yeah. That could and be even, a different story. Yeah, exactly. And even I think one of the, the key things is first, if we look at corn and soy production in particular, like soy, we export half of the soybeans that we produce, right? Mm. So first of all, there's no way that we could feed 67% of our production in the U.S. because we're exporting half of it <laughs> yeah. overseas. And similar with corn, we're a net exporter of corn. So that's, again, that's all I would, I would guess. Most, at the end of the day, your best source for all this stuff would be USDA. Like they do a nice job. If you go on their um, mm-hmm. pages for each of these commodities, they do a nice job of breaking out, you know, where do these things get used? What's the percent use of each, each of these categories uh, for all these different grains? Okay. And again, as I mentioned, you know, none of this stuff is static, right? As you know, again, people cannot like corn, but as corn yields keep increasing per acre, we just don't need as many acres to produce the same amount. And so all these footprint arguments, you know, they're usually cast like these numbers are set in stone. That's not the case at all. All yeah. these things can keep improving and they should keep improving over time. We shouldn't just rest on our, our yeah, laurels yeah. and say, oh, we have no ability to get any better, right? That's definitely not the case. No, that, I mean, and that's what you guys are doing over there. It's great. If they're, you're always trying to do better. Okay, we forgot to go back on, she said 95% of cows are industrial agriculture. What I believe is, and I think you told me that 80 something percent of farms are family owned and operated. Yeah. I mean, most of even a lot of these larger feedlot operations are just a family organization that has incorporated itself as an LLC or something. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess that somebody uses that in term industrial agriculture, you don't really want to answer it with a question, but you almost have to like, what does that specifically mean? Uh Right. Because usually, I think we had this conversation on our prep call of like, <laughs> you know, CAFO is thrown out as a pejorative, but it's, mm-hmm. of course, a regulatory definition of size of operation that then has to meet all these stringent regulations, right? So mm-hmm. a concentrated animal feeding operation for cattle is any an- operation that has over a thousand head in one location. And then they have to go through all these regulatory hurdles and not have any manure discharged into waters and have storage facilities for runoff of water and all these other Mm. things. So again, to say CAFO equals bad, it's like, well, first of all, it's good that we have regulations. Mm, Uh, We need to have regulations in these operations. And that's where I, as somebody that's been in agriculture all my life, I sometimes hear these things and like, I don't know what they're talking about. (laughs) And I've literally, this is all I've done in my life. Right. So So, no, it sounds like she's saying, okay, so 95% of cows go to a feedlot. Okay, I can accept that because we're not eating yes. that much grass-finished beef. The question is, what's the problem with that, right? So, right. I, I don't understand what the problem is. We know that cows, it's so funny that people who are most upset about humans like eating meat, these animal activist people that are so upset about all this, they're the ones asking people to eat more grains, yet they're thinking it's bad these cows can eat grains. <laughs> You know, it's like, so nutritionally, this is what we're going to get back to too, is like, are there any health problems with eating feedlot beef? Yeah. I mean, again, we always say it's, it's more of a personal preference issue, but if you look at the nutrient profile and just how much beef you're realistically going to eat, even if you're, even if you're the Sean Bakers of the world, right? (laughs) There's just a limit on how much you can eat. Um, It's not going to make a bio, there's no evidence I would say, right? That's going to make a biological difference to you. Mm. Again, if you feel like you want to consume grass finish, like that's awesome. But an evidence-based argument to say that, you know, feedlot finished beef is going to not be healthy for you. You know, that it, again, it comes down to what, what criteria are we using, right? What specific evidence do we have? And I'm always going to use that framing, right? Cause I'm a scientist, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, let's peel back the layers of this onion, right? Like the, a lot of things are just thrown out there. But they got a lot of embedded assumptions that when you peel those layers back to the foundation of it, there's nothing there, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, um, maybe there's a better omega-3 profile in grass-finished beef. But other than that, they're about the same nutritionally. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the ratio, you could make that argument. But again, if you looked at the absolute amount and it's not that much it, anyway. to your earlier point of like where maybe is this ratio in our food supply 
<laughs> where's that issue really coming from? Is it coming from beef or is it coming from all the other foods? That <laughs> well, consuming, that's, right? oh, that's a way bigger story is, yeah, if you're eating yeah. all these omega-6s from all the other foods, it's a way bigger problem than these tiny little amounts that are in beef. I right. Mean, the whole point is right. beef isn't a good source of omega-3 anyway. I'm also kind of just working against my own company here, you know, with the grass finished <laughs> beef, but that's why I don't have like any, you know, dogmatic views on any of this. Yeah, no, I mean, honestly, we tell people that too, when they're very concerned of like, you know, I wish we, you know, beef is an awesome source of you know, over 10 essential nutrients, but if you want to get your omega threes, like I can't tell you, you know, whether grass or grain finished, you should be eating beef over say salmon, right? Cause you're yeah, going to get a heck of a salmon. lot more, but yeah. yeah and then just you're, you're covered, eat one right? bite of sardines so, and you're, you're yeah, going to be a <laughs> exactly. lot better off than like a whole plate of beef. So exactly. Okay, but what? Okay, then what about the hormones? People have all these problems. They're like, oh, there's hormones, there's antibiotics. What about that whole story? Yeah. So in terms of most beef that you're going to buy in the grocery store that is feedlot finished, it probably was given a hormone implant, which Mm. is a little capsule that will be put in the animal's ear. And to be straight, like, why do we use this? We've used these type of things for 50 years in the United States. It's because it makes every bite of feed that the animal consumes more of it is converted into beef and less of it is excreted as nutrients to the environment, mm, right? Efficient. So that's why we, it's, yeah, it's an efficiency tool. That's why producers use it. And again, when people are like, well, I just don't feel comfortable with that, of course, certified organic or beef that is so-called marketed as, you know, natural, um, you know, never ever having been treated with uh, hormones, the animal hasn't been treated with hormones or uh, antibiotics. Those are other choices that exist for people. But it is an efficiency measure, right? And it's taken so out have, before it's slaughtered. Yes. Yeah, so just to clarify, when animals go to the go to a packing plant, one there's screening in terms of sampling of the, the animals, the the carcass, right, mm-hmm. for both antibiotics and hormones. So there's a list on the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service website that shows all the different things that are screened for. So these things are checked, and then I mentioned it goes in behind the animal's ear a little capsule. Usually it's been put in the animal's ear like 90 days before the animal goes to slaughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's really hardly anything left, but also the animal's ears will be removed. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things that happens in the whole disassembly process, if you will. There's no contamination there in terms of the human food supply. Mm -hmm. But that's just, again, that's why they're used is from an efficiency standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And antibiotics, I think that's always another one that's, that people are concerned about. So again, most animals, if they're raised, you know, so-called conventionally, if an animal is sick, a producer will treat them with antibiotics, right? Because that's a humane thing to do. Yeah. Uh, if just like a person is sick or your dog is sick, if you can do something about it, you are going to do that. But that doesn't mean, again, when I think what gets confusing is people see labels where it says no hormones, no antibiotics. There is no antibiotics in any of the meat you eat, right? Yeah. There's no antibiotics in any of the milk that you drink. There's, you know, that. <laughs> we, we just throw that out there really clearly. It's all tested. There's strict regulations. Exactly. And if you, even with the milk, if you, it's so risky. I don't know who's telling me about this, but they test this entire vat of thousands and thousands of gallons of milk. Every, and if, yeah. I mean, again, growing up on a dairy farm, literally every time the milk truck came to pick our milk up, they take a sample and they test every single farm for antibiotics, right? And, and if you'd be you screwed. Are, yeah, and if you're a farmer that you sense what we call hot milk in the industry, they dump the entire load of milk and you, the farmer, get charged for it, yeah. right? It's a huge disincentive, even, you know, first of all, just not doing that because it's not the right thing to do. So that's, of course, we have all these layers in the United States that the USDA oversees, which is good. Again, regulation is a good thing because it keeps our food supply safe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so when you see those labels, what you're buying is a production claim. Right. And that's just to be clear for people. And again, if you want to support that production, that's great. But you're not the product itself is antibiotic free and no food is could make the claim that it's hormone free. Right. Mm. Because hormones are just they're in all living things. Well, speaking of soy, there's a lot lot (laughs) of estrogen. Yeah, just a touch. Right. So you could detect a difference in the hormone levels for beef. But honestly, if you sent a heifer that was. In estrus, you know, it would probably be even higher than an implanted steer. Mm-hmm. Um, and to your point, there's plenty of plant source foods that from an estrogenic activity have way higher concentrations than any yeah. animal source food. So 
those are things that are hard to explain to people though. So I think that's where sometimes the marketing has been very effective that, I mean, if you just slap a label, it says no hormones, no antibiotics, and you're somebody that's, you're just going to the grocery store. I mean, you, you must be thinking, well, mm, okay, good. I guess that means All yeah, the other it stuff. sounds good and the other stuff must be bad. <laughs> yeah. right? And so I think it's, it's always kind of, we want people to be informed and be able to make their decisions, but also hopefully you're not making decisions out of fear, right? Fearing your food. Yeah. Um, because we are really lucky in the U.S. that so we have a very safe food supply. Yeah, that's a great message. And it's also these things, are, there's such a nuance to them. It took us an hour and 15 minutes to you know like get into these <laughs> yes. details. So it's like, yes. of course, when you're on Instagram and you're a vegan activist person, you could just throw out these giant bad sounding things and no one's going to know <laughs> the real story. Yeah. And I do want to go back to the, I know the antibiotic thing is, is something that people um, are concerned about, but and the one that they're concerned about is feeding antibiotics to animals. So just to be clear, you know, the FDA came out with a, a regulatory directive over two years ago now that you cannot feed antibiotics to any livestock species for growth promotion. Mm-hmm. But antibiotics can still be fed for disease prevention. Mm. And so that's the one that usually causes the most controversy for beef is that there are cases where antibiotics are fed to cattle for disease prevention, right? For mm-hmm. preventing a condition we call liver abscesses. So I just want to be transparent about that of like, that's usually where people are thinking or sometimes people are thinking about. And so again, there's from a human health standpoint, there's no evidence that doing that practice leads to antimicrobial resistance for, for people. Again, it's not in the meat, not in the products, but that's an active area of research because that type of antibiotic that is fed for that reason in the beef industry is a antibiotic that's used in human medicine. Mm. So the beef industry just in general is super interested in finding an alternative to that because, I mean, again, we share, we do share some classes of antibiotics with human medicine and we know that antimicrobial resistance is a pressing issue. Even if we can't directly draw that link, anytime that we can be more judicious with our use, it's better. So, um, that's a, that's a very active area of research looking for alternatives right now too. Oh yeah, that's great. So, well, there's also bigger problems with over people being too sick and over prescribing antibiotics. That's probably the real story. Exactly. I know. And, and our, our veterinarian community always kind of jokes about that. Like when we use antibiotics with animals, we give doses based on body weight. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're very cognizant of that and have withdrawal times. You know, animals are not going to go to slaughter when they've been recently treated with antibiotics, et cetera. Of course, with human medicine, right, if I go to the if I go to the doctor to get treated and get an antibiotic prescription, I mean, for the most part, it's going to be the same as a, you know, a big burly dude that's 300 pounds, right? It's going to be the same dose. Yeah. Right? And then you can and just then, get them like year round and it's just like, oh, I have the sniffles <laughs> and like, here's the antibiotic. And like, yeah, it's a whole yes. other story of how bad that is for humans. You're talking about, yeah, building up a resistance to it. You're talking about you're ruining your gut microbiome. Like that's what we should yes. be talking about, which is another big point is all this anti-meat activist stuff is kind of just like a smokescreen for the bigger issues, right? It's always, there's always much bigger issues out there that we should be focusing on, but they're kind of tugging at the heartstrings of people or using these smoke screens to try to say, oh, well, look, the the cows, the methane. It's like, what about the fossil fuels? It's like, oh, about these like little things over here. What about the problem that like, you know, over 50% of America is obese or diabetic or pre-diabetic? Right, right. (laughs) Because they're eating the wrong foods. If they could be eating the beef, they maybe they wouldn't be. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. We, yeah, there's a lot of missing the forest for the trees or maybe even for like a twig on one tree in this space, for sure. Yeah. So you want to recap any last ones of those kind of things like with methane? Yeah, I would just say on the greenhouse gas emission issue, I mean, the thing to remember is like according to the EPA, beef cattle in the U.S. are only 2% of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. And most of that is coming from methane. And I know that's (laughs) <laughs> that's a lot of biochemistry to get into, but what we know now from recent research, you know, from folks at Oxford University and other places is that probably the way we've been accounting for methane has been a little bit misleading, right? At mm-hmm. the end of the day, what we care about with climate change is the concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere and how that essentially acts as a blanket around Earth in terms of trapping heat. 
And of course, we need the greenhouse effect. If we didn't have the greenhouse effect, uh, it would be mighty cold on Earth mm-hmm. and there wouldn't be all the abundance of life that we have, right? But what people are concerned about is those concentrations have been headed up pretty at a pretty quick rate. And so that's what the whole premise of climate change is. And those gases include methane. So methane's been rising too. And, you know, people have been looking, okay, what are our sources of methane? We got cattle, other ruminant animals that naturally produce it or all those microbes produce it. Uh, wetlands, rice production, and fossil fuels, right? Mm-hmm. So fossil fuel production is another source. There's a lot of methane that leaks out when we're producing, when we're drilling oil. And of course, natural gas itself is mostly methane. Mm-hmm. And so that's what some interesting research recently is looking at this, this recent uptick in methane concentrations in the atmosphere and trying to figure out where the heck it's coming from. That's been debated pretty contentiously in the peer-reviewed literature. Mm -hmm. We still aren't completely sure, but there's some newer papers out there that would point more towards fossil fuels and towards towards especially natural gas and fracking and just the fact that there tends to be a lot of leaks in that process or methane that's cognizantly, I guess you would say, vented Mm -hmm. from those systems. And maybe we've been underestimating how much that's been contributing, right? Which kind of makes sense because the, this recent uptick kind of almost completely coincides with the fracking boom, right? It's kind of a yeah, you know, there's weird not some coincidence. Huge <laughs> uptick in animals all of a sudden, and also no, no, as I we mentioned, I, right? Yeah. The cattle numbers are pretty stable in the U.S. in the last decade or so, and on the long term, they've come down, right? I think I saw yeah. this paper. They're talking about how they could trace. They found a new way to market, and they kind of can trace that it is from that fracking yeah, source. Yeah, yeah. There's a professor at Cornell University that recently published that paper where, yeah, not to go way into the science, but essentially the, the carbon atoms themselves have different isotopes, and you can look at the ratios of those isotopes and try to figure out the source, mm-hmm. um, the different weights of the carbons. And based on his assumptions, you know, we've probably not had the right weighting of carbon coming from natural gas, especially these fracking sources just because you know they tend to be in a different part of the earth's crust and so they have different weights and so based on his calculations a higher proportion of this recent methane uptick is actually from natural gas not ruminants. yeah um but that that said again this is a very super active area of research that's happening and that's again that's how science works right it's an iterative process people are going to argue back and forth and hopefully we get towards the truth here yeah. um, in the next few years. Well, it's great. And well, there's also more to it. We're just talking about methane. You're, there's a whole story of, well, the methane being the short lived gas and the CO2 long life cycle. And this, there's so much more to it. Mitt Loner covered some of this. So we don't, people have to go back and listen to Dr. Frank. Yeah, definitely. Definitely listen to that because that's where the, this whole premise of the fact that the U S herd is not growing is very central to our entire contribution to global warming, right? If we're not adding more methane to the atmosphere, adding more of this heat effect, if you will, it's pretty darn hard to point to U.S. cattle as a source of (laughs) this methane. It's crazy. It's crazy. I have so many other things. Maybe we could quickly kind of run over some of her arguments that I didn't get to. Sure, sure. So, because I wrote some notes when we're on this call with her. So she's just saying, like, say the IPCC, there was a big report that came out recently. And she's kind of just like, well, we have to look at the science here. And all these unbiased scientists say that we should eat less meat. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, I think, again, like, if you look at what the IPCC actually said in that report, in their whole summary for policymakers, if you search for the words cattle and beef, they don't even appear, mm-hmm. right? That report was about how are we going to adapt agriculture to a changing climate and mitigate emissions. And dietary change is mentioned, but it is not it is not the headline, even though that's what captured the headlines. They also call out, you know, animal source foods as a part of diets and that it's about having it be sustainably produced in resilient systems. Mm -hmm. Right. So, again, we could argue, yeah, of course, it's about how things are produced, not this exercise in trying to rearrange people's plates. That is, at the end of the day, is if we put all of our hopes on solving climate change by trying to eat our way out of it, like, unfortunately, we've already lost. Right. That's just not going to help. We've done the numbers. It's not going to make a difference. It's going to be a couple percent. 
So, yeah, I've read a lot of it. I didn't read a lot of it. It's super long. I tried to read at least like the overview sections and kind of dig into some of it. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about eating less meat. It's basically just saying, oh, there's some inputs that are greater than others, but it doesn't even mention them. I mean, specifically in the overview. It's not like, you know, because say like rice or like avocados or almonds, like they take a lot of water. And then also they, they talk about food waste. They say food waste is a big way we can reduce our impact. And then I think it's kind of obvious that we waste a lot more plant foods and animal foods. Just you can think about it logically. It's a lot cheaper, these plant foods, and they go bad faster and they're less valuable to you. But I mean, there is data on this too. And I I should post this graph. I rearranged their data. It's all the same data, but I just put it, I grouped it into animal versus plant foods. And there's way more waste in the plant foods. So if they're saying that we should not be wasting as much food, I mean, you're kind of making the point that maybe we should be eating more animal foods or eating less plant foods. Yeah, and that's one of those trade-offs and those complexities and those, like, uh, you could almost say, like, a rebound effect that's often not included in models, right? So if we're going to shift to more fresh fruits and vegetables, like a lot of people want us to, which, you know, hey, that's fine. That's one way to go about it. But to your point, those tend to be wasted the most. And there's some just, like, logistical challenges of trying to supply them you're going to have a lot of waste. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's where like dietary change, when you actually look at all these ripple effects, it's just, it's just not going to amount to much. Right. And I wish people would realize that again, the 800 pound gorilla is the fossil fuel emissions. And then it's like, okay, how can we improve all agriculture? Right? Everybody agrees on that. How can we cut food waste? But dietary change, to your point, it's got all these perverse things that would happen that people don't like to acknowledge. Yeah. And just another kind of high level stuff that they mention is food security, land and climate change responses. You know, they're mentioning transport, like they're not mentioning food, desertification and land degradation. All right. We already brought that up. Ruminants mm -hmm. are good. They help mm -hmm. reverse desertification. So, I mean, it's how you interpret this. Like if you or I read this report, we could say, hey, we should be eating less plant foods, maybe, you know what I mean? Maybe, or maybe <laughs> right, we should be right. doing better, uh, more cows and, you know, helping reverse this desertification and helping you know, efficiency and all this stuff. Right. Yeah. And I think, again, if we think about, you know, the potential impacts of climate change, it comes back to our earlier conversation. We do not want to be pigeonholing ourselves into a less diverse agricultural system and just being more reliant on crops. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to have crops and livestock and that's, what's brilliant about livestock. You know what? They're mobile. They can move. Mm -hmm. Crops are just like, they got to be grown in that space. And if the climate changes and they're not able to adapt to those crops, then you know, that's a, that's a bigger issue, right? So there's perhaps more vulnerabilities in some of those spaces mm. than in the livestock space. That's interesting. Okay. Here's another quick thing. She thinks that government subsidized meat more than plants. Yeah, that's another one that I read often. And again, being in agriculture my whole life, I kind of scratch my head. So just to be clear, there is no, there are no direct subsidies for beef production in the United States. You know, then usually people move to, well, we have crop insurance for crops that we then feed to livestock and et cetera, et cetera. I guess if you make those arguments, I mean, you could say that everything is subsidized in America because mm -hmm. we have a government mm -hmm. uh, that functions. So I, I don't know. It's, I'm yeah. not really sure where some of that comes from, but again, there are no direct subsidies for beef. It's only like if there's a natural disaster that the government will do, like there's a big fire or something, will do indemnity payments or something. But I mean, that's um, not, yeah. Well, she yeah, says she actually, of. I wrote this down. She specifically mentioned the checkoff program. She says that the government subsidizes industrial animal. Yeah, ag. to be clear, like we, we are 100% funded by beef farmers and ranchers. That's another one of those myths that's out there that is interesting. But all checkoff programs, like there's a checkoff for the dairy. And I, I told you before, like there's a Christmas tree checkoff. Mm -hmm. But they're all funded by, by the actual industry. producers. Yeah, it's USDA does do oversight of our program. But we actually reimburse USDA for their time. So even oh, that wow. is not government funded. So... Oh my God. Um, okay. She just, the problem is she just went down this rabbit hole, right? This, it seems what happens with these anti-meat <laughs> activists yes. is you go down this rabbit hole and she's been working for some organization for the last 15 years and they're just like digging. They have it all memorized. They have it all yeah. memorized and they, so, all the misinformation memorized. Yes. Yeah. So she says the top 12 global meat producers don't report GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So that, 
I'm assuming she's thinking of meat companies, so like the packing plants, which of course, like for beef in the United States, they don't own cattle, Mm -hmm. right? So we have a reporting system for U.S. agriculture greenhouse gas emissions through the EPA every single year. Mm -hmm. Our emissions are inventoried, so... They're accounted for, but she... They're accounted for, yeah. Yeah. Then they're, quite frankly, they're modeled a lot better by EPA because they farm it out to... Actually, almost all the agriculture emissions are modeled by uh, Colorado State University just up the road from me. Mm. Um, people that are experts in doing that. Interesting. Okay, she talks about antibiotics leaking into the water system. So that, I, I, I don't even know. I'm not sure where she's mm. coming up with that. What about, um, well, or manure. I think she talked about this too, where something about these like pools of manure and from feedlots. Mm. Yeah, so again, this comes back to CAFO regulations are a good thing, right? Mm, so yeah. these CAFO operations, they all have to have non-discharge permits, meaning they have to collect everything on their operation. So if you were to look at an aerial map of these feed yards, you'll see a big, like a retention pond that essentially the whole feed yard is graded and engineered so everything drains into that. Mm. Um, yeah. And it's, and it's lined. It's lined, yep, so it's impermeable. Again, that's that's why we have these regulations, because it would yeah. be bad if they were just discharging all the while. Into- oh, yeah. But I think on our call, you mentioned that maybe she was like, oh, in North Carolina, there was this, maybe it was uh, yes. like a disaster, you know, like. A- yeah, it could be, right? And and that's, and that is a concern. Natural disaster. Um, yeah, in those parts of the country where there are, and those tend to not be beef operations, right? They usually are swine or chicken operations, more low-lying areas that are susceptible to hurricanes and flooding, right? I mean, if you get 40 inches of rain in 48 hours, right, it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. how big your pond is going to be. It's probably everything's going to be overflowed. Both livestock operations and, unfortunately, probably waste treatment plants of cities and towns, too. So, that yeah, like human feces. (laughs) Yes, exactly. That happens quite often as well that people don't necessarily realize is that that can often get discharged into waterways, too. So yeah, it's not like a cattle industry problem. It's it's like sort of a natural disaster problem or like sort of, it's just... Yes. Most of our cattle operations that are feedlot operations tend to be in the high plains of the U.S. where we don't get a lot of moisture and that's actually on purpose, that they're in a drier environment. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot close by to where I'm at in Colorado. I mean, we only get like 15 inches of rain a year here. So... so- Sorry, I'm trying to run through these. Well, a few minutes or more minutes here. She keeps relying on those. She's like, well, these big scientists, they just say, they agree, less meat, less meat, better for the environment. She's like, Oxford study, less and better meat. Meta-analysis, you know, this is, you know, this is what we know. We know they always say less and better. These are unbiased scientists. What's going on there? So I think it's a small group of people that all cite each other that creates a view of consensus, and there is not a consensus in this space. So I think there's plenty of other data out there, again, that would show the benefit of animal source foods. And this this kind of comes back to coming back to a few of the things that we've talked about. A lot of this is framed about like the future, right? The next 30 years, 2050 is the grand challenge. We're going to have almost 10 billion people. Mm -hmm. But most of that demand growth for just food, and then especially animal source food, is not in the U.S., we actually, we haven't, we've been eating less beef per person in the U.S. Oh, yeah. I have those figures. That they're going down. People have listened to the advice, the stupid advice from the <laughs> government. <laughs> yeah, that's our situation. Like, that's the U.S. situation. And that's where they don't understand. It's like all the demand growth is happening in developing countries. Those are countries that tend to have more nutrient deficiencies, so they probably should be eating more animal source foods. Mm-hmm. And, oh, by the way, those are the countries that tend to have more environmental impacts per unit of food production. So it's like all those challenges for us as humanity are in a lot of these developing countries, and we should be hopefully helping those folks out, right, get better. And that's where I worry, like a lot of this, you know, kind of privileged conversation is very focused on the U.S. and Europe, and we're very (laughs) self-centered in that way. And we're not thinking about most other people in the world and where all the people are going to be in the next 20, 30 years. And I think we should really, again, if you want to make like a human human flourishing argument, you know, that's that's the way to spin that around of like, hey, we got to take care of our brothers and sisters in this world. And a lot of it's going to come down to nutritional quality. We know animal source foods are good foods. We got to figure out how we, through human ingenuity, help those people get better, yeah. not dictate, you know, now you had to eat a crappy diet 
you know, we ate a good diet for decades in the wealthy countries, but now you can't eat a good diet. Like that's just, and, that's not tenable. Like our height has gone up, our health spend's gone up. Yeah, you everything. Know. Yeah, exactly. All these indicators would, would point to, it's been a good thing. So now we're going to turn around and tell other countries they can't do that. I don't think it's so. insane. So we need to make it more efficient. We need to help them. And they have their livelihood is based on animals a lot of times in these other yes. countries. Yes. There's hundreds of millions of people that directly every day depend on animals. Yeah. For, to make a living or to eat directly or all that. Draft power, right? Yep. All sorts of things that come from animals besides food. Yes. So, I mean, after this, if I wish this woman would listen to this. She wouldn't listen to this or she'd ha probably have some <laughs> problems. I don't know what you'd say. But it seems like the exact opposite of what she's saying. Is that just because you and I are so like-minded? Well, we in this? agree, right? Yeah, we agree yeah. on some of these things. But I do, I do sometimes, yeah, I forget how far off or how big the chasm is between perception and reality. And I think, you know, I think I referenced that in the beginning of just where I sometimes start with people is like, okay, this is how beef is actually raised mm -hmm. in the U S because I think a lot of these snowballed effects, you know, scenarios that people come up with start with a basic misunderstanding of how things actually are today. Yeah. And again, that things have changed a lot for the better. And again, we can argue that we need to change a lot more, but you also can't argue with some of these, again, these statistics of we produce the same amount of beef today with 36% fewer animals compared to 1975. Mm -hmm. Like that's huge yeah. in terms of efficiency for beef. That's a good thing. Yeah. Again, that's not known. That's not known. By many people. Well, and these statistics, I was just thinking about why these big climate scientists say, you know, she claims say that we should be eating less meat. I think the problem is we have the wrong baseline calculations in the first place. If we're, they're using water, like, oh, any rainwater that falls on the grass right. that the cows ate, they put that rainwater in there. They're doing all these ridiculous calculations or, that are wrong. Yeah. So if you start with these wrong calculations, then maybe well-meaning scientists will just be oh, like, of course. right? That, that seems to be the big yeah. problem, right? Yeah, I think, and, and that's that's a very good point. I think most people that are advocating for some of these things are definitely well-meaning people, right? I don't think yeah. there's some sort of nefarious plot. But also a lot of the major actual climate scientists are not harping on this, right? I think a, a key one is Michael Mann, who's probably the most visible out there. He's at Penn State University. <laughs> he's been very upfront about that several times where he's like, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not going to start advocating for people to do dietary change because that's not going to amount to anything. I love you know? that. It's like, I didn't it's, know that. I it's fossil fuels. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, he's, he's very big on this whole idea that a lot of this focus on individual action and kind of moralizing about some of these consumer choices is just a big distraction to these underlying issues. Again, getting back to that, missing the forest for the trees big time. When it comes getting to these calculations too. I mean, it makes sense. If you're doing CO2 calcs and then you're just using what, you know, some anti-meat person, well, I don't want to blame on that, but you're using this calc of what you thought right. beef, then I could see how maybe you could recommend eating less meat, but that's just because you are using the wrong data. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, it's like, if you look at all beef production in the U S it's just compared to our fossil fuel burning in the U S you know, there's no comparison, right? I mean, like beef production in the United States is less than one half of 1% of global emissions. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Right. So we could get rid of every cow in America and like seriously not even de detect any climate yeah. difference, right? Or any it's greenhouse gas emission smoke difference. Screens. It's yes. Red but we herons. burn yeah. we burn ten or eleven percent of the global fossil fuels in this country. Uh, right? Yeah. So again, it's just like just look at the numbers and like if we want to make a big difference, we should go after the big pieces of the pie, not these tiny slivers, right? It's a waste of human energy on <laughs> well, things that aren't going to make a big difference. Oh, it's so irritating. All right. So we got to wrap it up here. Can we do two senses on lab grown meat or like impossible burgers, like these alternatives? <laughs> Just what's the high level? Thing? Yeah, the high level. I mean, if people want to consume plant based, like, you know, you do you. I think my main thing for impossible, again, that they, they have kind of this crusading mission to eliminate animal ag and i would just point out to them like you guys can't eliminate animal ag mm -hmm. in your own supply chain right so that's that's kind of the takeaway of that lab grown meat yeah lab grown meat non-existent currently i think it's a lot of hype no disrespect to the scientists that are working hard on that but i think essentially what they're trying to do is replicate the cow 
And I think we're probably <laughs> better cow. off stick, yeah, <laughs> just sticking with the, the end product of three and a half billion years of evolution, right? That one's probably going to win. Yeah. And just a um, simple, like how many inputs are there going to be to get this? <laughs> how many refrigerated <laughs> factories with tons the, of carbon footprint? Honestly, the, the case for plant-based is much stronger than lab grown. When you really think about it, lab grown is taking animal cells you know, and they say, well, if we take the animal cells out of the animal, we're going to be more efficient. It's like, wait, how does that work? You're taking away the nutrient supply, the immune system, you know, like this, that's terrible. You logic. can't cheat nature. I think it really comes down to it. We can't outsmart you could, nature. You could, but it would be a huge footprint to your point. Oh, <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Not, but like, it this, would not make sense. Well, with all yeah. factors included, I don't think we can cheat nature. I think that's kind of a no. bigger thing that humans yeah. don't think about. We think we're so smart and so great because, oh, yeah. we went to space. I mean, we still didn't cheat nature. Like there was a huge cost to that. Or, you know, if you're, we haven't gotten better than nature yeah. ever. And I don't know if we ever will. It's like, how are we going to get all these microbes? Like, can we ever replicate the millions of microbes in a cow that are like producing these amino acids and then no. this manure and yeah, the soil and building the microorganisms? All those, so. all those benefits. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, we already have solar powered plant-based protein. It's called beef right? <laughs> and all the other meats that we eat. So that's that's a great point. I think that technology is actually I always my thoughts is like that would be cool to like grow people new livers or kidneys or something, but I'm not so sure about food. Yeah. You know? All right. Last last question now. Just to try to see what we can do better, right? We're not perfect. You say you always said this to me in the beginning and you probably said it on this podcast that you know, it's not perfect the system, it's what we got. How can we do better? Like what points do they have that we can improve on? Yeah. And so I think that's where a lot of it, it comes down to some of the things we've done in the past is focusing on the same area. So I brought up like animal genetics before. I think that's a huge area of opportunity for our industry is we have not focused on efficiency as much as say pork or chicken has. Um, we're much more again, an extensive industry. So we have big potential to improve our efficiency at converting feed into beef mm -hmm. and doing so while still paying attention to animal well-being and welfare, right? So it's not, those things are not mutually exclusive. Um, so that's a big one. I think there's some super cool technologies now, um, even though, again, methane's probably overblown. If we can reduce methane emissions, we can actually, again, improve feed efficiency of cattle. Mm -hmm. And so some of those technologies of different feed additives or different ways of feeding cattle to reduce methane emissions, I think are super cool and could be a bit of a game changer if we can get them uh, cost effective for our producers. Yeah. Was that the algae stuff? I read about that a while back. Yeah. So there's algae. Um, and that the, the question mark for that is if we could actually grow enough effectively and not cause like another environmental problem by growing <laughs> a bunch of seaweed somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's some cool research happening at UC Davis on that. And there's another one that's a compound called 3NOP uh, that's that's being developed by a Dutch company that's also promising. So there's a few different angles there. And then anything, the big thing for beef is because we use so much grazing lands is anytime we can improve grazing practices, um, help our producers become even better land uh, stewards, that has a big impact, right? Because yeah. I like that, this like, tiny fraction... Grazing. Or something, yeah, or like, tiny fraction mm. of the population that controls or manages hundreds of millions of acres, right? So anything they can do to get better is is a big deal. Yeah, moving them around and doing all kinds. Yeah, there's all these little tricks and stuff I people are doing. Awesome. All right. Any parting words for me and my little debate on stage? I just, I'd say good luck. I mean, again, you're probably, to your point, if the person you're debating is not constrained by the truth, I think the <laughs> the best thing you can do is just to just to provide the facts and be professional and and uh, usually people will decide uh, correctly in terms of the credibility of of different folks speaking in that situation. I like that. Yeah, some people have told me just stay calm. Yeah, don't attack. Don't be rude. I'm just yeah. I'm, and just present the facts. Well, you've helped me a lot. Thank you so much. And I will. Um, yeah, hopefully kind of represent us well. Impossible Foods is going to be there. Like all the big meat industry people are going to be there. It's going to be all kinds of food industry people. So hopefully cool. I'll spread your message. I'll spread the good word of Dr. Frank Mitloner and all the other good beef people. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thanks, thanks for so having much. me. I really appreciate it. Okay. I'll see you. Well, there it is, guys. Get your own grass finished meat at nosetail.org. Support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash pqhuman. Pre-order the film at foodlies.org. Check out our YouTube. 
Get daily content on the Food Lies Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Sign up for the newsletter on sapien.org. Get on the wait list if you're a health coach, doctor, or other healthcare practitioner at sapien.org. And most importantly, stay happy and healthy, my friends. See you next week.